other seat that I know of is as important in this upcoming election in the Secretary of State. Uh, and we have an opportunity to put forth a qualified uh, African-American candidate uh, in a rich tradition and legacy in that of uh, Richard Austin. So it brings me honor and pleasure to welcome back to the NAACP uh, our ally and our friend, Attorney Godfrey Dillard. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, good morning, uh, Reverend Anthony. Good morning, Karima. Well, it's always good to, to be here uh, at the NAACP office. Uh, I've been a life member, I think, since, uh, I think, about 1975 or 1976. Um, uh, I remember uh, Joe Madison was a good friend of mine who uh, years ago was the uh, executive director of the uh, uh, NAACP and uh, I was involved with what he did. Um, I've also worked, you know, over the years with Elliot Hall who was also uh, very important. Um, I've had the pleasure, I think, over the years to work with some of the great civil rights uh, lawyers uh, of our generation of the past. You know, I, you know, I worked with uh, Kenneth Cockrell for a number of years. I've worked with Milton Henry for a number of years. Uh, I've worked with the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, I've worked with the Hispanic Legal Defense Fund, the Asian American Legal Defense Fund, and i worked with a great team as, as being a part of uh, our victory before the United States Supreme Court on the affirmative action case where we came together nationally uh, to put that piece together and ultimately win. So uh, uh, that was one of the great moments of my life to, to really have had an opportunity to, to really make a difference, not, not so much for myself, but for the future generation of uh, young people who uh, are going to be our leaders tomorrow. Uh, for those who don't know me very well, I'd like to give you a little bit of background of who I am. Uh, my father was one of the original uh, 99th Fighter Squadron, which was a member of the original 100 Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, my mother was from Louisiana, my father was from Arkansas. Unfortunately, my father died uh, at the young age of 36. He was uh, a grocer. Uh, I started working at seven years old delivering uh, Detroit Free Press to help out with the family uh, funds. So uh, I, I know about single family homes. Uh, I know about small business. Uh, I know about being in a large family. So uh, the values uh, that my mother and grandmother uh, gave me and the rest of us, uh, you know, education was the uh, central thing that she pressed. You know, I was an all-state all football, all-state basketball player. Uh, I was the first uh, black in the Southeast Conference. Uh, that was Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, mm -hmm. Louisiana, Florida, Tennessee. I uh, have the distinction of being the first uh, black to play against a white athlete in the state of Mississippi, Starkville, Mississippi. I'll never forget it. Too dumb to be scared. Uh, uh, but uh, I did participate in the civil rights movement. I, I believe I, I felt the sting of uh, discrimination, racism. Uh, like most young athletes out of the urban area, I wanted to play a professional ball. Unfortunately, I had a major knee injury, uh, which uh, Shut, cut that off, uh, but you know I fell back on education. Went on to the University of Michigan Law School. I had attended Vanderbilt University on the athletic scholarship in Nashville. Okay, let me turn to you to talk about Secretary of State. As you mentioned, Donnell, a lot of people see the Secretary of State as being about license plates and the like, but the fundamental job of the Secretary of State is the management the time, the place, the methods, the procedures that are related to voting and to elections. And, you know, voting is the fundamental right of citizenship. It is the building block of uh, democracy. Uh, and when I decided, uh, you know, I had been considering, as uh, Livonia slipped up on it, thinking about attorney general. Uh, but uh, as people talked to me, I came to the recognition that, you know, Godfrey, this is a real opportunity for you to make a difference. If you can win the Secretary of State's position and fundamentally change how elections and votings take place in Michigan, it, it would be a great uh, legacy for me and, and, and uh, a contribution that I could be proud of uh, for young people and, and everybody in the state. So I decided to do that. Uh, and so let me talk a little bit 
uh, as you know. And then the other thing that interested me about it, you know, most of the sec most of the Secretary of States in the past have been um, people have viewed them as clerks or uh, administrators. But as we all know, in recent years, voting has taken on a very legalistic uh, orientation. Uh, you know, you have recently had the, uh, the, the Holder decision, uh, which struck down the Voter uh, Voting Rights Act, uh, at least the, the, the principle, the Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act was struck down. And then you had the uh, Citizen United, which reflected a little bit on the campaign financing, where in which you now have corporations now have free speech rights, uh, which is kind of oxymoron in a sense. Uh, you know, typically it's, you, it's people who speak, uh, not corporations. But so as you see, uh, uh, and you've had a history of the Republican Party over a variety of uh, uh, years uh, suppressing or diluting the vote, you know, you had, and particularly if we relate back to the Jim Crow era, you know, the poll tax, the requirements for uh, uh, um, uh, literacy, and, the like, and, and a lot of people don't understand that the, the real essence of that, and that's why I'm saying I think it's important now at this particular stage in history to have an attorney as a Secretary of State to kind of, you know, who understands the legalism that's going on around the old voting and can see a pathway uh, through it. The, see, the principal problem that we've had with voting <clears throat> is that there is no federal constitutional right to vote. That's the problem. Uh, because the, the, the Supreme Court over a variety of number of years have interpreted that the, the function of voting is a state's rights issue. In other words, it's within the province of the state under uh, the Tenth Amendment and, and the, and the uh, uh, Privileges and Immunities Clause set forth in the Article One, as well as the Privileges and Immunities Clause uh, that's in the Fourteenth Amendment. And as a result of that, we have every state is free to set up its own rules and regulations as they relate to voting. There is no uniformity in voting. And therefore, you, as we saw in the Jim Crow era, we had the southern states instituting certain uh, restrictions, poll taxes, literacy, uh, residence requirements, and like various forms of voter suppression to restrict the black vote. However, fortunately, uh, uh, we did get the, 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 the Voting Rights Act, which came out of the fifth uh, clause of the 14th Amendment, which said that they had a right to, to uh, uh, 15th Amendment, excuse me, had a right, to, the Congress had a right to pass laws to guarantee uh, the right to vote. Now, keep in mind, women did not even have a right to vote. I think it was the 18th Amendment, or the, I think 18th or 19th Amendment that, that brought women. Uh, the right to vote. And, and as of course, we had a restriction also on voting as to age. I think it's the uh, 24th Amendment, or 26th, 24th, that, uh, that, that reduced the voting age down to 18. So we have, over the course of years, had some federal legislation that tried to bring some order to the chaos. You can't restrict voting on account of race. You can't restrict voting on account of sex. You can't vote uh, restrict vote on the, on the grounds of poverty, with the poll tax. You can't restrict race on account of age, reducing it down to 18. But when you get outside of those areas, there is no constitutional right. In other words, you have to prove that there's some form of discrimination on race, some form of discrimination on sex, some form of dis discrimination on poverty, some form of discrimination on age in order to get a federal remedy to come in and, and correct what the state is saying. And from a lawyer's point of view, that's really a very small area because there's a lot more to voting than those areas that I just talked about. So uh, here we stand today uh, with basically states free to do what they want to do. And so we have these much more subtle and sophisticated ways of diluting voting. Uh, for example, not enough polling places, okay, would be a restriction. Um, uh, voter ID requirements, where in which a person has to show some type of voting identification 
in, uh, in order uh, to vote. I even see the, the, the attack ads, in my opinion, on TV, where you see uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, degrading each other on TV as a form of voter dilution, of voter suppression in my part, because it destroys the confidence in the voting process because you begin to look at the, at the, at the so-called potential leader that you're talking about, whether they're the governor or the attorney general, secretary of state, you, you, you are shown, they are shown in a negative light as if they're con artists. And so therefore that psychologically or, or uh, suppresses the desire of, on a part of people to vote. So there is no wonder that in these days where we have, as Lon Johnson, the head of the Democratic Party likes to talk about, over 900,000 people registered to vote did not vote in the last election. 900,000 people registered to vote. I'm not talking about citizens population. I'm talking about people who actually went there and registered to vote, but didn't go to the polls to vote. Okay, so where I stand now, you know, I want to do something about that. Now, what can I do to make a difference? Well, the Secretary of State is in control of that game in Michigan, and that's what I'm concerned about what goes on in Michigan. I've talked a little bit about the federal problem, but we now need to focus in on, on, on Michigan. We must start with voter registration, because you can't vote unless you, unless you register. Now, there is the, there has been a suggestion out here that Michigan somehow has a voter ID restriction on voting, which is false. Michigan is not a voter ID requirement state. In Michigan, the law says that you, can, you have to present some evidence of who you are. That could be driver's license, utility bill, bank statement, and a variety of other things that you could present to, to establish who you are. Now, even if you don't have that, you can sign an affidavit that says that you're a citizen and a resident of Detroit and the state of Michigan, and the, the, the person who's accepting the registration has to register you. Now, notice that that's a two-way street there. It, it takes two to tango. It takes the person knowing when they go in there that they don't necessarily have to have a voter ID and knowing also if they don't have any idea, I can still go to register to vote, but I'm ready to, to swear on the oath with a notary because the person taking the registration has to be a notary, will notarize that you are who you are. But on the other side, the person who is registering you must have a, 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 an approach to registration of inclusion. I'm not gonna say to the person, you know, Where's, the first thing I say to them is, Where your, where's your driver's license? Or, or maybe they don't tell them that, you know, you can sign the affidavit and still register to vote. Or they are playing games with the people at the line such there's a line up of people trying to register to vote and they become discouraged about, well, wait a minute, you know, I don't know if I have every, everything that I want. Maybe I need to go back home and they don't even register.